Welcome to our session. My name is Peter Crosby with Dot Sub. We're going to be talking about how to make video world class, and a lot of that from our perspective is around language. Um, since we have an awful lot of open seats, would folks mind moving up a little bit? Is that, uh, I, I promise if you have to leave, it's not an issue for us, but maybe it would be a little more conducive if folks are up in the tables here. It would be fun for us. Thank you. So um, let's go ahead. I'd like to ha have our three panelists go ahead and introduce themselves. They know a lot more about, thank you very much for moving up, uh, a lot more about themselves than, than I. So if you would, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Anja Schaefer. I'm VP of Global Solutions at Lionbridge. Lionbridge is the world's number one globalization company. We work with uh, over 800 of some of the world's leading brands. We help our customers uh, take their products global and effectively engage their customers in each local market around the world. So that means we provide translation and localization services. We also provide digital marketing production services, all with language at the core. Now, many of our customers sit in marketing departments, and so we help them with their global marketing efforts. Since video has become such an important part of any successful marketing strategy, we also help our customers uh, to translate and, and localize their videos. And that's what I'm here to talk about today, the importance of video in any successful global marketing strategy and best practices for translating videos. I'm Michael Novak. I'm the CEO of uh, One Plus Two Media. We, we got our name from the effort in Europe to have um, all EU citizens speak their native language plus two more. Uh, our focus is the delivery of enhanced English media to the two billion people that speak it as their second language worldwide. I also have a, an, a second hat, which is I'm on the advisory council of the only college in the United States that's part of a motion picture studio, which is Relativity School in L.A. So the, um, so the kinds of media that I'm exposed to go from high-end Hollywood movies down to distribution of content, um, in rural areas of Africa. So it's quite a range, and, um, and so that's the area that I'm involved in. And uh, I'm Charlie Young. I look after digital media for IBM, our internal workforce and communications, uh, and also our investor relations team. Uh, we have 400,000 people around the world in IBM, 170 different countries, and so uh, it's, a, it's a very diverse uh, company, and, and to look after communicating and engaging that workforce uh, is my mandate, and it's uh, some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so just to, to move forward, I have a question for folks. How many languages do you think there are in the world? Just, just shout out a number. 2,000 I hear. Anybody else? Mm, and nobody else. OK, good. That's, that's a good betting odds. There's 6,700 languages in the world. And the top 10 languages, as far as population, cover uh, uh, almost 80% of the world's population. One of the things that was amazing to me is that language is so much a part of people's lives and culture that they are written into constitutions. And then here is where the, literally the, the title of our session came from. Um, the idea that when you are speaking to someone uh, uh, intellectually or to their head, uh, it, it may communicate at a certain level, but when you speak in people's own, own language, especially in video, which is more emotionally uh, charged, uh, the opportunity is to really speak to people's hearts. So language is big. What I'd like Anya to do is to give us a sense of the market size and why it's important to be able to localize or to be able to translate your video into many languages. Thank you, Peter. Oh, and thank you, Justin, for the water. <laughs> Okay, so let's take a look at the key role video plays in a successful global marketing strategy. So I'm going to start you out with some numbers, 85, 40, and 53. These numbers tell a story. So 85% of, of visitors to a website who viewed a product video were 85% more likely 
to buy than visitors who don't look at video. That's quite a big number. Um, retail sites with video, they increased their conversions by up to 40% and also boosted the average ticket. Um, search, video plays such an important role in search. Um, a properly optimized video actually increases your chances of a Google front page result by 53 times. So you have to have video to rank highly in search results. So these are just some of the stats that explain why video is such an important part of any global marketing strategy these days and why the spend for video is increasing year on year. If you look at where marketing dollars are being spent, video is one category that's consistently going up. So let's take a more global view to this. I mean, I think everyone here is aware of just the tremendous growth of video content and video consumption. I mean, YouTube is growing at a rate of 73%. But did you know that 70% of YouTube traffic comes from outside of the US? So YouTube content is posted you know, from 56 countries in 61 different languages. So most of the content is actually you know, not, not English. So a couple of years ago, a company called Common Sense Advisory, and they are the main analyst for the language industry, they conducted a survey. They, they surveyed consumers in eight different countries and the results are, are quite um, striking. So 72% of consumers spend most or all of their time on websites in their own language, even if they speak English. Many people around the world do speak English, but they prefer being on a website in their own language. And those same 72%, they said they would be much more likely to buy a product if the information is available in their own language. When it comes to price, more than half of consumers said um, language, having the product content available in their own language is more important to them than price. Think about that. So it's absolutely necessary to translate your content if you want to sell your products globally in other markets. Um, a question that we're often asked by our customers as well, so which languages do we choose? And clearly, you know, every company's language and market strategy is different. But there are some interesting statistics. So if you want to reach 80% of the world's total online population, you need at least 12 languages. And if you want to address 90% of the global online economic opportunity, you actually need at least 13 languages. Slightly different list, a lot of the same languages, just slightly different um, order. So the top. 100 global brands, these are brands like you know, Coca-Cola, Apple, Google, Microsoft, IBM, Samsung. I mean, they, they have on average um, up to 14 YouTube channels each and 187 videos in each channel. That's a massive amount of video content. So if you then multiply this, we just heard 12 or 13 languages is what you really need. I mean, you're looking at just massive amounts of video that you need to translate. So if you're a marketer with a limited budget, what do you do? You don't have a budget to professionally translate all of those videos into you know, 12, 13, or you know, many companies do a lot more languages than that, up to 30 languages, or Microsoft over 100 languages that they typically translate into. So you want to balance um, quality, like you know, what type of content is it, what, what purpose, what audience do you address, what quality level do you need, what turnaround time do you need. Sometimes timeliness is more important than quality and of course your budget. And that really means you want to choose the right translation solution for your videos. There are different options available and you can go from you know, subtitling on the low end, that's the lowest cost and the fastest solution. You then have sort of text to speech, you have voice, but it's synthetic voice sort of as a mid range option. And then the high end of the range, you have voiceover. Even within the voiceover category, you can have you know, professional voice talent or a slightly lower cost option with freelance voiceovers would also be a possibility. And that really depends on the type of content for your you know, highly branded, highly visible content. You want, you know, most likely to go with that professional option, but for other types of content and videos, you one of the other options might be perfectly appropriate. 
And that's um, what I have. Do you want to give him the Willy Brandt quote? Absolutely. We were chatting about this um, earlier. So I'm, I'm from Germany originally, and uh, so I'm, I'm allowed to use a German quote. I mean, again, having content available in the language of your consumer is so important when you want to sell products. So Willy Brandt, the famous German politician, he said many, many decades ago, if I'm selling to you, I speak your language. If you're selling to me, dann müssen Sie Deutsch sprechen. So that's really what it comes down to. You need to speak the language of the person you're selling to, of your consumer. Uh, thank you, Anya. Anya's uh, perspective on marketing and uh, mostly push content out into the world is one way to approach the marketplace. Obviously, you're looking at the particular demographics of the target language or market. Um, Charlie has a, a point of view from inside a corporation, which I think is fascinating how much uh, IBM is dedicated to uh, using video and language to literally change the culture. Charlie? Thanks. So I actually am just going to show you an example of something that we've been rolling out. Uh, let me ask a question first, though. How many people in the audience actually know what IBM does anymore? <laughs> of course, from Oracle, you would know. <laughs> so yeah, a lot, of, a lot of what IBM does, you know, it's not a, a retail system or a ThinkPad or anything that, uh, that you, anyone can, can touch or envision anymore. And so you know, a lot of the work we're doing is in data analytics and cloud and security and mobile. and, uh, and we were, poi we, were, we, were poi we were presented this question from our CEO, uh, how do we disseminate that knowledge to the rest of IBM and enable the rest of IBM being as big as it is and in being all those different countries? How do we share that knowledge with them so that they have an understanding of what IBM is doing and what our strategy is? And so a couple years ago, we rolled out what's called the Think Academy. And I think you'll see... Uh, this is, uh, this is my login page on the Think Academy. And the Think Academy is basically uh, an online uh, learning, almost a university uh, for IBM employees. And you can see that I've logged in on the corner, uh, and this is my uh, page. And you can see at the top it says, you know, how are you doing? So there's an actual scorecard on, on things that you've learned and how much of, of, of modules uh, you've completed. Um, it's all voluntary. It's not... Um, required any of that learning, but uh, once a month our CEO actually will introduce a topic for all of the IBMers, uh, what that topic is, why it's important to IBMers, uh, how it uh, affects you and your specific job role. So me for marketing and communications, you know, a lot of the information for sellers and for developers doesn't apply to me, but, but each of the topics is sort of uh, broken down into, you know, what you do in IBM and how it affects you. So, you know, if we look at some of the other pages, this is just, um, you know, the, the top uh, opening page, and there's other things that you see in those boxes in the bottom, you know, IBM and the weather company, we just purchased uh, the data side of the weather company, what that means for you, um, and other things happening in the news. So if we go, you know, further into, into the, the Think Academy topic, this is the way that it's, it's laid out. There's uh, the topic, and, you know, it's broken into pieces of video, uh, really short consumable video. It'll be an introduction from the CEO. It'll be a client conversation that we've had with a client in that specific business. Uh, or it'll be, um, you know, an interview with uh, a subject matter expert. There's also uh, one page documents, uh, PDFs, uh, so that you have, you know, basically the what are the five important things that you need to know about this specific topic, and this one being the Internet of Things. As we go further down, we can also, um, you know, customize what we're doing. So this page is a page that we did for, um, we had a thousand managing directors in IBM meet, and we customized a page for them prior to their meeting, and we, we pulled a lot of different modules from all the different courses uh, and, and, you know, compiled this one page with all these links on why, um, you know, the managing directors, the information they need before they get into the meeting. And a couple other snapshots really quickly. Um, to handle video, uh, we caption in 11 different languages, but it's also, you know, and we also 
we all run into this with video. What happens if someone can't see the video when it's embedded or if they're having problems uh, viewing the video? So we provided other options for people. They can take uh, the video to go with them and load it. They can watch it at their own convenience when they're disconnected. They can take an audio only version so they can, you know, podcast style on the train or on their commute. And of course, um, you know, part of what everyone else on the panel is speaking about is the language and the, the, uh, the translation. And so we translate into 11 different languages and almost anything at the senior VP level and above, not just for Think Academy, but any of the communications that we put out to the company uh, is translated and captioned before it goes out uh, or else I get in big trouble. So the last one is just, uh, you know, some of the the video that's in Think Academy, it's being reused in other parts of the company. So this one actually, someone took uh, a video that we had produced and they had embedded it in their own specific senior VP blog. He felt that, you know, our CEO said something really profound about uh, cognitive computing. So he took her cognitive computing piece and specific to his community was able to share that uh, and, and, you know, disseminate that within his specific community of employees. And, That's it. and Charlie, just correct me if I'm wrong. This this is not open to the public at all. This is just this is not. This is internal only. There's certain pieces that we put out on YouTube that we feel um, would apply for the industry and would be good for the industry to know what IBM's viewpoints are. But I'd say 60% of it is internal only. So most people would never see this. And uh, how many video hours do you think you have now? So we're on topic 22, and we have anywhere from 5 to 15 uh, video modules for each of the topics. We try to contain it within an hour, so some of those videos don't apply to you know, a specific person. So me and marketing communications, out of 15, you know, 6 or 7 may apply to me. And the, the percentage of usage to me was, was remarkable of the population of IBM. Right. So at first, when we first rolled it out, we only had um, English captions, and we found that a, a large uh, percentage of the population wasn't tuning in. Um, it's, it's only tracked if you log in. There's no requirement to log in, but it tracks so that you can see the status. Uh, and then, you know, we noticed that as soon as we, well, there's two things. One of them is we needed to improve our internal video delivery. And I've been working over the last two years to enable a better video delivery system inside of IBM. But when we rolled that out and we, roll, we rolled out the translations into the different languages and we translated the website into different languages, we, we saw like an exponential amount of, of uh, participation. Great. Um, so that the internal trying to change or, or uh, make a culture of the company more uniform. Um, yeah, I loved your question up front. Who knows what IBM does anymore? Uh, probably interviewing IBMers would be an interesting answers too. Um, and, and Michael Novak has a perspective, really a world view perspective on how video can touch many more markets and open up uh, opportunities going forward into some of the developing countries in the world. So um, uh, I'm going to give you a little, a little story. I used to run, I was the CEO of the leading intercultural communications company in the U.S. and one of the projects we had was integrating the space station, training the astronauts and cosmonauts on how to live together in a closed room for six months when they couldn't leave the room. And uh, that was a very interesting project. One of the key questions that came up was around problem solving. And so you're on the space station and there's some sort of hydrogen leak. So you have a problem you need to resolve. The first question in problem solving on the space station is what language are we going to talk about the problem in? Are we going to talk about the problem in Russian? Or are we going to talk about the problem in English? Because the choice of language dictates a little bit how we go around trying to solve the problem. So that's really getting into your point that, that, that language is very important. The thing that I really want to stress is a phenomenon that I call peak English. And right now, there are more people studying English than there have been in the history of the species and that ever will be as long as there are less than 10 billion people on the planet. Uh, there are 2 billion people speaking English, uh, uh, learning English right now. Um, the second language market is the uh, for every native speaker of English, there are four non-native speakers of English. And people that produce video or media tend to only think about the language learning component of that, where in fact, um, 
it represents a $100 billion industry projected to go to $170 billion. So in terms of ROI, I, you know, I said, I'll take 1% of the delta. I'd be happy with just 1% of $70 billion. I'm, I'm a happy guy. So, so um, our focus has been to do two things. Reduce the dependency on translation as much as possible by, making, by lowering the bar for English comprehension. And we've adopted some techniques that research has shown doubles the rate of literacy improvement rates. So our conversation to the people that we're trying to address is, so you can, it's true that, that if you receive the content in your native language, it affects you more emotionally. That's offset by the opportunity that you can probably get a better job if your English improves. So would you like to be more emotionally moved or do you want a better job? And I think that there's an argument for both of those. Um, so our, our focus is, is that. And fortunately, there have been a number of, of improvements in, in additional components of video, much the same way that, that sound was introduced to film in the 20s and color was introduced uh, what, in 1940, 38, um, that the use of text component to augment comprehension is a relatively recent phenomenon for the web. And I want to show you a couple examples of that. So I have about four short 15-second clips. The first one is, a, is a, an example of same language subtitling. And I'll, and I'll, Tonight, go ahead, go ahead. one of the bravest girls in the world. Malala Yousafzai became renowned for demanding girls be given the right to education. Shot in the head on her school bus. She was a student who wanted to learn, but now she's fighting to live. So the subtitles in this, in this environment are a, like a karaoke style. And the use of that style of subtitle doubles literacy improvement rates over static subtitles. So the, the bar to comprehension goes down. Also, if you show something like this to a native speaker, they'll say, I find the subtitles distracting. And that's exactly right, because they're not the target, target audience. The, the visual focus shifts because of the animation of the subtitles more to those than they do to the other part of the thing, but it also automatically in increases comprehension. It's been shown to double literacy improvement rates for 100 million school children in India, and we're taking that not only in India, but in Japan, where they pay for content, which we like, uh, Korea, and then across Africa. Second format is a format called RSVP, and I'm guessing we're the only people here that talk I about- Nephi, having been born of goodly parents, therefore I was taught somewhat in all the learning of my father. And having seen many afflictions in the course of my days. So, the, the, the focus RSVP format was, was developed originally by, Carne by Carnegie Mellon as delivery of media to a small screen and certainly to a feature phone. Um, one word at a time is a beneficial way to do that. I know it, I, the, the focus I talk about now is if you want to deliver video to an iWatch, uh, you can deliver audio and format like this um, that, again, increases comprehension. One of, the, one of the target markets for this is the dyslexic market, where you don't have to read, you're just getting the words delivered to you as you get it. Um, this is called RSVP. You can look it up on, on the wiki site, um, Rapid Sequential Visual Presentation. Um, so that's, and that format can be used also as a subtitle format, just one word at a time. Um, so that's the second format. Uh, the third one is, um, has to do with bandwidth. So this is the VOA Special English Education Report. This week on our program, we answer a question from Japan. A listener named Maki would like to know if the test, known as the TOEIC, is popular in the United States. So. A lot of, one of the issues around video is that the bandwidth is too fat for distribution over telecom to cell phones and tablets. I personally believe that distribution of cell phones and tablets is really, really important. And if you look at the market in Asia and the market in Africa, a lot of people, the only way they access the internet over, is over the 3G plan. Now, I don't know about anyone else in here, but I have never downloaded a feature film to my smartphone over my 3G plan. The only way I do that is over Wi-Fi. 
only 10% of people in India have access to Wi-Fi. A lot of them have smartphones, but, but only 10% have access to Wi-Fi. So if you want to have a distribution platform, this is streaming media, but you don't have to get attached to starting this out with a camera. You can start out with content. And you know, there's a lot of educational content that basically is a professor showing a PowerPoint slide and talking to the PowerPoint slide. You can do that with this sort of a format. And because of the, of the compression algorithms that are used, the bandwidth compression using this, which also significantly improves its comprehension, um, is only about double the bandwidth of the audio side itself. So you have a delivery mechanism, and the telecom people in Africa, they love this, because you can deliver content that scalably improves literacy that can be delivered over, over MTN or Vodafone um, to smartphones and tablets. And the last, before you hit it, the last one is one focused on kind of a transition into your points about multiple languages. Um, some languages, so if you start from English, for example, some languages, if you, well, you would know like German. German takes, tends to take more characters than English does. Uh, so does Spanish. Now, me, I, I, you know, I speak a little bit of Japanese, um, and I'm pretty familiar with Chinese. Chinese is a compressive language. So if you take 50 characters to say something in English because the character set is so much more um, sophisticated, you can do it with a lot fewer characters in Japanese and Chinese. So it's an impressive language. So one of the things as a platform for translation is you want to take into account your source language and the, and the delta, whether you're going into an, ex, in, into an expansive language or a compressive language, and deliver your source language targeted for targeted for where you want to go to. So one of the things that, that we do, for example, is we can deliver um, the English, if it's English, or Spanish, if it's Spanish, or whatever, in a variety of lengths dynamically, so that the translation company then can choose, if they're going into Chinese, they can take longer English, maximizes the chance of an entire sentence being that one caption, and if it's going into German or Spanish, they can go with a shorter one so they can make sure that it fits the closed caption requirement of US broadcast, for example. So if you want to, this is another short one. This is. We already um, talked about the fact that associational thinking has sometimes been called right brain thinking or lateral thinking. Uh, but the general idea is associational thinking is this ability to connect things that haven't been connected before and put them together in new ways to perhaps and hopefully solve a problem. And that's how the brain works. So that's, that's a, a video platform um, that was done by one of the largest um, higher ed companies in the United States around disruptive innovation. And we're delivering the English for that, not only to market to the multinational corporations, because if, you wanna, if you're like IBM, you want to be able to increase communication across the supply chain. And if you're doing communication, it's not push where you're trying to extend something out, but you want to have a conversation, you have to do that in the same language. And so we're expanding the ability to understand the English, but we're also aware of the fact that there is an advantage to moving into other languages if necessary. And so we're delivering that into three different lengths, depending upon what the translated language is going to be into. So Great. that's that's another example. Great, Michael. So so the the question that I have and the the nature of the topic was to be about ROI. Where do you find ROI? How do you measure it? How do you convince your leaders in your companies or organizations or, or in some instances in government? Um, where is the ROI in video being translated into different languages or using these different video formats which are very specifically targeted at uh, audience need? All right, so, I'll, um, well, our, our focus is addressing the documented market opportunity of 100 to 170 billion dollars spent on English media to the second language market. Um, it, it's a, I'm happy with 1%. One, 1%. Um, a lot of what we do to measure it is, for example, in, uh, in movie theaters, we measure how often people go to a film twice, once in their native language, and then 
the guy who sees it in the native language, they ask their girlfriend out on a date. He takes his girlfriend, who's Japanese, on a date, and he, they watch it in, the, in English, and he can impress his date by how much he knows the English. Uh, so we think there's value to that for increased ticket sales. Um, another way of doing it is looking at the English level of the viewer and matching it against how they, which language they choose, how many of them want to observe the content twice, once in their native language and then once in English, to get the full benefit of the media that's been delivered to them. Um, so it that's. Seems like Anya, Anya had some, some ROI thoughts. Can you get those in? Absolutely. I mean, I think some of the stats I presented earlier speak for themselves. I mean, video is absolutely critical. You know, sales increase when you use video. Um, one example is the online retailer, uh, retailer Zappos, you know, the shoe and clothing retailer. They have seen an increase in sales from between six up to 30% for products that have a video on the site. They do it for a lot of their products that there's a video available that you can look at. I mean, that's a clear example right there, how having videos, you know, it does boost sales. So couple that with uh, some of the numbers are presented around, you know, international consumers and how important it is, how much more likely they are to buy when content is available in their own language. I think that's a clear ROI right there. Mm. And Charlie, uh, the, the, the massive number of people you have watching, how do you then turn that into some calculation that returns? Well, I, I think for, for IBM and being internal, the return, it's, it's not, uh, you know, a number of, of sales per, per se, but we look at the numbers of uh, participation and you know outside of Think Academy, because Think Academy is not required, uh, we see you know that participation because it's introduced once a month, we, we see the participation climb, um, but we also do a lot of internal live webcasting from the CEO and the senior leadership team. And uh, you know, um, once we improved the, the delivery and the bandwidth um, and we've, we've made it more interactive. There's Q&A, there's polling, there's live chat. Uh, as we've implemented all of these different things, we've seen the participation rates increase, and so we've been doing uh, some live webcasting uh, company-wide. Uh, we've averaged about 90 to 100,000 people, and we've seen it you know, climb from our initial one of 45,000 people uh, and I think the last one were were close to 100. So you know, to to get that sort of buy-in and that excitement from the employees is sort of our way of looking at that. Um, and of course, you know, clicks to videos. Um, but I, I think it's more about how do we engage them as opposed to how many eyeballs we we get to. Right. And and for um, our company, Dot Sub, we translate video into any language. Um, we have two statistics which are. Um, very consistent as far as uh, our customers using captions. Uh, in general, captions, uh, simply adding them will increase the amount of completions of your videos by 30 to 40%. Um, secondarily, the interest in the Hispanic market in the United States is, is so huge. Um, it's a major part of, of our business, translating into and out of Spanish. Um, one of the largest, uh, shall we say, uh, meteorological companies in the world, um, works with us and has tested their A-B tested Spanish uh, translations for different kinds of content, news, reporting, uh, uh, evergreen content on allergies, etc. And they found 43% more completions because it's translated into Spanish. So there's an opportunity to actually give more value simply by increasing the target language to the right people. Right, any questions? We have had questions for people? Please, uh, for Charlie, So the question is for Charlie about mm -hmm. uh, localization. Is that something done in-house or do you use external vendors for that? So uh, we do a little bit of both, actually. We use a lot of .sub for some of the translation, especially around the video. Um, so we, we try to put everything out captioned uh, in English. Uh, some of it, depending on um, our turnaround time, it's either with a vendor, if we have a really quick turnaround. Uh, there is some machine language captioning that we do uh, in IBM, and so um, I'm in the middle, actually, right now, of writing guidelines for the rest of the company and our marketing communications organization on what needs to be translated, 
turnaround times for that, what needs to be captioned, et cetera. So, um, you know, it's a mix of both vendor and, and some of our internal tools that we have. Any other questions? David? How much of the translation is third party sourced and how much is crowdsourced? So I would probably say a majority of it is third party um, just because we use, we use .sub actually extensively for most of Think Academy and uh, a lot of the marketing communications teams around the world will do that locally. So I guess it's, it's crowdsourced in a sense, but it's all internal. And so we have, we have teams that, that will work on uh, translating either specific documents or helping with some of that, that machine language captioning and turning that around into a different language after. Michael? I'd like to make a comment on crowdsource translation. Um, there are really two, two kind of methods that are out there in the market about using the benefits of the crowd for translation. One of them I think works just fine. The other, I, I'm just going to recommend that you not consider that. Um, and Peter's thinking, which one is he going <laughs> to? Um, the one approach to crowdsource translation is you take an hour video and you break it into 120 30 second segments and you just everybody gets 30 seconds. Um, th there are actually companies out there that talk about crowdsource translation that use that as a technique. I'm just going to say if you see that walk, don't you know, run, don't walk away from that because the, the the quality of that is absolutely terrible. It's cheap, but um, there's a recent lawsuit against Harvard and MIT, first one that we think is a, is a breakthrough that is not suing Harvard and MIT because they're not, they're not subtitling. They're suing them because the quality of the subtitles are so bad that they're ineffective. Um, so uh, the second method of crowdsourcing is to distribute this to a variety of people who, who maybe one per person or I mean one video per person or two people per video then focus on that, and then you can get some quality out of it. But I'm just, that's just my comment. And, and if, if I could add to that, from a marketing perspective, you want your, your highly visible marketing videos. I mean, of course, you want quality translations. But I think more than that, you want to produce videos that are locally relevant but still brand consistent. So I think having a centralized approach to translating your videos rather than, you know, each country does their own or, you know, random crowdsourced videos. I mean, I think it's just important to have a standard process to ensure that, you know, the branding guidelines are followed, there is consistency while still producing that, you know, locally and culturally relevant content for each market. And, and we work with, uh, our platform enables crowdsourcing or community sourcing if, uh, if you'd like. The distinction that we make around community sourcing is we work with Adobe. Adobe has a thing called Adobe TV and they have 14,000 videos there that they've accumulated over eight years, all of them in English about Photoshop and Premiere and Illustrator, et cetera. And what they've done is they've created a community and an ethic there that people can come in and voluntarily do a translation. They earn Adobe points, which they can use then to go to conventions or, or get a new version of Premiere. But again, that is a community. It's a, it's a closed environment only for people who are qualified. In that sense, they're part of their developer community. Um, we have uh, large corporations that have used, uh, so backing up a second, um, we're the technology behind the TED Talks uh, translation, open translation project for the first five years. TED has since built their own uh, engine to do that. And we've had major uh, Fortune 500 companies take the TEDx model, which is a, a franchisable uh, replication of TED talks around the world, and do them in six or eight different cities, and then work with their employees in those cities to then have them translated for their particular locale. So sometimes we'll do the English language captioning, they'll do the translation. Um, and then the, 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 the balance around crowdsourcing or community sourcing is not every enterprise is TED, where people really want to go and show off every skill they could possibly do for free. Um, and employees, requiring employees to do something like that, mostly is felt as an obligation that, wait, 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 I've got a job here. 
And so oftentimes you get very inconsistent, you get a huge drop off, you get videos that are only half translated. The, the analogy we use is, is similar to open source. Open source, they used to say, open source software is like free kittens, right? Free kittens, a wonderful idea, we all love them, we bring them home and then we have to spade them, train them, uh, uh, replace the couch, um, all those kind of things. So the idea of a community being built has to be massaged, has to be thought through, has to be consistent. So while it's a great idea, um, there are caveats, as you've heard. Other questions? Please. No, oh, let's do the mic. Yeah. Hello, yes. Thank you for the presentation. Very informative. My name is Andreas uh, Damiano. Um, I work for the UN, so multilingualism is very important to us. Uh, actually, we are mandated by the member states to produce live streaming in, 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 and video on demand in uh, six languages. Um, and we produce about 10,000 videos per year, more or less. Um, our challenge, though, is, is the, the cost for the storage. Um, uh, uh, so far, we're using smart players and are not able to stream from the single video with multiple audio tracks. So we have to store the videos uh, right now in English and the original language of the speaker um, until we find a solution to be able to save in storage costs. Um, can you provide any recommendations in um, uh, any solutions that we can have a single video with embedded multiple audio tracks so we can save storage for languages? Well, one of the, I have two responses. First, uh, go to H.265 and cut your bandwidth costs for your videos in half. Um, so you might want to consider uh, re-encoding. Second, I mean, there are some platforms and some video players that will allow for multiple embedded um, uh, subtitle tracks in the same, for the same video. JW Player is an example of that. So is the Apple platform. Um, so if you go to those sort of devices, like if you went to JW Player, you'd have the same source video, and it also supports H.265, and then you can have, I've, I've done, uh, uh, President Obama's inaugural address we did for the White House, and, it, and we did subtitling in 10 languages for that, and it works just fine. So a lot of it depends upon the player that you choose. Um, uh, of course, the sophistication that required to do that goes up, it's always easier just to burn the subtitles into the video. So if you do that, then you're going to have a storage cost problem. And then how much of the storage destination for the UN is actually lower bandwidth? Is that a consideration? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, most of it is lower bandwidth for the web. Uh, the high quality videos. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> yeah, for, for the web, you know, most of it is lower bandwidth, you know. Uh, uh, but the, the, um, we have also high quality video f videos for broadcasters that we store in the MOMS system for that. But for the public, yeah, it's, it's, lower, it's lower quality video. It's mostly talking heads, meetings. Some news videos, of course, yeah. Do you also work with UN University in Tokyo or is this all the New York based stuff? Um, if they produce videos, yeah, we distribute it for them. Um, we cover all the meetings from New York, some from Geneva, from the ICJ in The Hague, and from conferences worldwide. So, in, yeah. Michael, do you think some of the technologies you were describing earlier as far as the lower bandwidth would be? Well, yeah, I mean, it depends on what, what it is you're trying to show. If you're, if you're doing a professor with a PowerPoint slide, I mean, you really don't need the, the face for that. You really just need the, the slides and the subtitles for that. And that cuts the, if you're not throwing 30 frames a second up at the screen, I don't care what compression algorithm you use, you're gonna use a lot of bandwidth. And that, that's coming down, but if you have an opportunity to use, think about other formats, then that's gonna be another solution. Um, we, um, we're, we have an operation in Accra, which is where Kofi Annan used to, uh, uh, that was his, his home, home country yeah. and his home language. And um, so there's a lot of UN operations in Accra. And, um, uh, uh, so the issue about distribution of media across Africa, uh, using um, Accra as a hub is something that we're looking at right now. That's, uh, uh, so you can go to a distribution uh, strategy like that. Also, I know Charlie's wrestled with some of the bandwidth issues. Can you tell us more? Yes, yeah, so uh, 
When we did it at IBM, because we have, we, we installed 350 caching servers around the world to enable video um, to all these different countries. And so we, we take source video, it's usually um, 1080p video, uh, we upload it and it's transcoded into multiple different bandwidths. The highest that we deliver is two megabits. So afterwards, all of that source video is taken down once we've transcoded and then that is, uh, is put into cloud storage. So we actually, once we've taken that, that high def uh, source video, it's taken off the servers after so that we can reduce what's, what's being sent out. So you're basically streaming proxies that are lower bandwidth and you retain the original Yeah, so we, we transcode to, you know, two megabits, one megabit, 500K, uh, 250K, and then that package, each of those packages is sent out to the caching servers around the world. And so uh, people that are joining from Tokyo will go to a local caching server as opposed to trying to come to, uh, uh, you know, a server in North America. Great. Any more questions? Really fast one for Charlie. And for all the translation you do, you, I think you said VP level and above. Um, do you have a centralized budget for that, or do you, does that get budgeted by each individual content creator? So um, I look after uh, CEO and senior leadership. So um, I work with each of their comms uh, leaders, and we have a centralized budget for senior VP and above. And then um, we have uh, open POs with several vendors that um, through, if, if anyone at a VP or GM level needs something translated or captioned and they don't have an open PO, they can go uh, through me or someone on my team for approval to, to access one of those uh, open POs instead of having hundreds of POs open. And, and as, as advocates for video being internationalized, being localized, um, how do you convince leadership um, that this is something that must be done. Charlie, you said earlier it's the right thing to do. Not every corporation has that point of view. Right, and I think that, you know, I'm, I'm really lucky with, uh, with IBM and especially our Think Academy. And, you know, when, when we had Ginny take over as CEO, I think she's in three, just over three years now, one of her big mandates when she became CEO was to become more engaged with the IBMer. And so a lot of this uh, engagement through digital came from the top. So I'm lucky that I have that support. And so, you know, for her to approve this delivery system that we've installed. It's, it's not, you know, it's not an easy task to do, but, uh, but I had support from her for, to do this. So it made things easier. I know for a lot of companies it's, it's, it's really tough, but I think uh, if you can get that employee engagement and, and, you know, prove to the higher ups, you know, how much more engaged they are uh, in getting that messaging, then I, I think you have, you know, some leverage in, in, in hopefully getting some buy-in. Well, what if do you guys have any final comments that you'd like to uh, share with us? I'm I'm talked out, you know. <laughs> and, you, and you sound it. Yeah. So, so one of the things that, um, you know, uh, I'm not uh, assuming that everyone in the room is American, but um, having traveled around and lived in different countries, it's uh, amazing the kind of worldview that most Americans have. Before 9-11, only 16% of Americans had passports. Now, because of mandates around traveling to Mexico and to Canada, 28% have uh, passports. So we're not by nature a country of people who want to internationalize. So I'm going to leave you with a, uh, uh, it's a bad joke, right? It's a bad joke. Someone who speaks three languages is what? Trilingual. Someone who speaks two languages. Bilingual. Somebody who speaks one language. American. <laughs> so there's an opportunity to communicate with the world and to also educate ourselves, our workforces. Um, and uh, I think that the opportunity is around more engagement that has to do with people actually caring about people. So the idea of the Nelson Mandela's quote, which I had up earlier, around speaking to people's hearts. Um, we're in the video business. We think that that's inherent in the video business. Adding translations which actually speak in people's na native languages speaks more to the heart. So thank you, everyone, for, for coming today. And uh, if you've got any other questions, please feel free. Thanks.